Well, good evening, everyone. This is our medical advisory committee meeting. Uh, we are utilizing a hybrid model where we have four in-person attendees and we also have a number of virtual attendees. Our goal this evening is to um, really work through some very basic, I would consider to be foundational issues that we uh, discussed at our last meeting that uh, it, it may be very helpful for us to, to uh, revisit and discuss uh, this evening. Um, the first is to, to discuss what are the goals? I think on the agenda we discussed what are the goals of our mitigation programming in the Walatosa School District. And, and so I, I open this up for um, the committee to, to give us some thoughts. Um, but I also want to invite our, I believe I saw him online, um, maybe uh, Dr. Eric Jessup Anger could uh, maybe weigh in because he's he's been part of this journey from the inception and has uh, informally talked a lot about different goals that we may have for our mitigation strategies in the district. So Eric, uh, I want to invite you to start the process and then invite others to, to weigh in. Thanks, Devon. Um, so I, I think where I would kind of like to center the conversation is um, two, two different goals, uh, and hopefully they're very closely connected. One is the goal to keep uh, kids in school five days a week, uh, that that is kind of central and core. Um, and that would be keeping um, to the greatest degree possible, uh, both not having schools go virtual, uh, but also keep as many kids as many days of the week in school, um, limiting quarantines and um, in illness spread and, and those things. The second I would have, um, and, and I've talked about this a lot um, with Dr. Means, and I think we've talked about this as a board, um, certainly I've kind of put this as a key value, is ensuring that we can um, put the community and community building, community engagement, uh, family engagement within the schools, uh, in, in creating a sense of normalcy with that. Uh, so wherever we can have events, activities that bring parents to the school to be engaged with students um, in ways, um, it, the, the, there's a lot of value in that, in connecting parents to the children's education to the greatest degree possible. Um, so those, for me, have been the two things uh, throughout this year that I've been thinking a lot about um, and would kind of put as key priorities. Uh, keep the kids in school uh, to the greatest extent possible while balancing uh, their well-being. Uh, the well-being of uh, staff and kids, and then finding ways to engage and uh, bring families uh, as close to the educational experience and process as possible from volunteering in schools to uh, connecting with students and kids through events and activities um, in those sorts of ways. So those are the two things that I think I, for me, uh, I would lead with. And I think the board um, has placed a great deal of value in. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I want to invite others in terms of goals that you think we should hold true um, for our mitigation strategies. We have two on the docket as potential goals, which is to remain in school five days a week in person, and two is to conduct as many of our family events, community building events as possible. Um, those are two suggestions I hear. Any others? So this is Sonia Phillips, the social worker at Wauwatosa East. My goal in participating in this and the way I have been thinking about it is that our mitigation efforts were a or are a stopgap until a couple of things happened in my mind. One is that, uh, that the vast majority of people inside our organization, kids and adults had access to the vaccine. And um, the second would be that we would have a vaccine percentage that was fairly high so that um, 
we would um, be left with people if people people who chose not to vaccinate, it was a choice and not an issue of access. So yeah, I love the way you framed it. So your your the goal you're suggesting is that our job was to keep as many of our students or our unvaccinated citizens within the school district as safe as possible until they had the ability to be vaccinated. I wanted to be cautious in our mitigation strategies, um, thinking of the most vulnerable student or staff that was in our organization until they had access to the vaccine. So that's, it sounds like a, a step one, step two piece. So if that's goal, if that's one goal, Okay. Is there a second goal associated with it, or is that a, just a standalone goal in itself? So for me, once in my mind, once vaccination was accessible to all, then it changes the conversation a little bit to me. Sure. And then um, to me, then we would be looking at strategies in case. So it would be the conversation would flip a little bit, and it would be more. Um, the conversation about what measures do we need to have in place in case there's an outbreak. Thank you. Anyone else? We'd just like to reiterate Tim Richard here, um, maximum amount, amount of school attended by all um yeah i'll leave it at that end events this kind of goes along with keeping kids in school but i think keeping kids healthy should still be a priority for us good evening laura i <laughs> can you expand on that a little bit because i agree with you that that's a, a noble and legal goal that we have uh, as a school district. As I asked Sonia, is there a, another step to that? Is there a sub point to keeping students as safe as possible as a goal? Yeah, I think it's, you know, over the course of the past couple of years, we've, we've adapted to a lot of changes in COVID and a lot of new information that's come out, new variants. And while, you know, vaccination rates are really important and vaccines are going to be one of the main things that get us out of this pandemic, we're still dealing with potential breakthrough cases. Um, not everybody, you know, for whatever reason, chooses to be vaccinated. We might not get to that number or whatever that might be for some time. So I think even though the vaccine is available, making sure that we're still keeping other mitigation in place to reduce the amount of COVID that's in the school. Thank you. Inviting others to weigh in and share. Uh, I have a total of five suggestions here. And I think maybe Tim's suggestion and, and Eric's are the same. Remain in school five days a week in person. Encourage as many family slash community events held in person as possible. Keep our most vulnerable stakeholders safe until vaccination is available. Maximize the the maximize school attendance availability. I think that kind of ties in with the first one, Tim, and then keep students as safe as possible. So we have about four. Um, I think there's a difference just between keeping schools open and making sure there are as many kids there as possible. And I think, you know, the revision that we're talking about today addresses that piece. Yes, that's true. I, I'm working under the assumption that schools will never close again. You know, so. Tim, I, I, I was just going to say, I, I, you're, how you said it was really short and to the point, uh, but it's maximized the number of kids who are in school so that we lose as, so few, as few of days as possible for each kid across the district. Um, so you keep saying it much faster and more clearly than me, but I agree. What I'm saying is what you're saying. I'm going to stop talking now.
That's awesome. Thank you. Good, good feedback here. Good brainstorming. Any other suggestions for goals? And if we're going, if this is going to be sort of like formally defined, then I think it would behoove us to at least express that we are um, concerned with, as a committee, we're concerned with mental health or adjustment in this pandemic. You know, I'd, I'd like to see something maybe stated more, more formally about that as well. I think you and Laura are on the same page. I mean, this isn't just about physical health. Keeping kids as healthy as possible in my mind means um, physical uh, and, and mental. That's awesome. Thank you, Jenny. We're having great collaboration here. Any other feedback or any suggestions? One other thing that I would add, and one thing that I've tried to do as we've been doing this, and it's difficult, is to be as forward thinking as possible, um, knowing that we don't know all the answers, but giving our, you know, as somebody who I have a little bit older kids now, but especially with younger kids, being able to plan ahead just a little bit um, is incredibly important for our families, I think. And with the pandemic, it's been really hard because we're learning on the go to be that forward thinking. But as we learn more, I think we have the opportunity more often now nowadays to be a little bit more forward thinking and give our give our community and our parents and our students a little bit of a heads up on what our thought processes are and what we think the rest of the year is going to look like. Thank you. This may be um, just elaborating on Jenny and Sean's points, but I think um, I would like to see just uh, efforts to make sure that any transitions, um, we're considering those from a social emotional standpoint and making sure that those are smooth and our kids are adjusting well. Um, they know what to expect and why, um, and that we're taking care of the reactions that may come from changes in mitigation and um, we're supporting those. Thank you so much. Great suggestion so far. I see a hand up from uh, one of our guests, Jamie. Um, usually we have not taken questions or comments during medical oh. advisory committee meetings. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to change that. It, it, it feels like I've been here a long time, but I'm still new um, and was not aware that was protocol. So thank you, Jamie, was not aware. Feels like it's been a long time. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Sorry, sir. I see your hand up and maybe you, if, if there, so let me say this to our guests. Um, your feedback is important. If you do want to email me personally and give your feedback that way, I would, I will take it that way um, and welcome your, your comments. But I do not want to break precedent. Um, on on the on the fly so please accept my apology for not breaking precedent but uh i'm going to go along with what has happened in the past any other suggestions for goals As a committee, then, we are suggesting, 
that we're looking to create a goal around maximizing the number of students in school throughout the rest of the school year. That we're gonna maximize the number of in-person family events and community events uh, um, held in our schools. That we want to keep our most vulnerable stakeholders uh, in mind and safe until vaccination is available. That we wanna keep all of our students safe, both physically, socially, and mentally as possible um, throughout this process. And that we should have a goal of being as forward thinking as possible in terms of projecting what what's coming next. And um, Chastity's, I think this goes along with her statement of when we do project transitions to make them as smooth as possible and communicate why they're happening and help people work through those changes. For those of you who are there virtually, I see Dr. Nolan's even shaking his head. So I, I see I see nodding of heads, both virtually and in person. Um, if there are any other comments or suggestions, um, please weigh in. Okay. I think having goals is, is always helpful. And so as we, continue our conversation this evening. Let's keep those goals in mind as we, we dive into two things. I apologize, I, I jumped into the, I jumped into, it looks like it would be uh, C of our agenda in terms of goals. I wanna turn it over to Mr. Jamie Price to review our COVID-19 data as it stands uh, today. So Jamie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I think going over to data will then help us have our next conversation around potential modifications to the framework. Jamie. Thanks. Um, so what I've got on the screen, everyone can see the dashboard on the screen. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what I've got on the screen right now is our city uh, and county statistics. An important thing to note, and Laura Stevens, I hate to put you on the spot here, but uh, the data that we've received from DHS is only uh, from December 2nd, so it's not the latest. So, Laura, once I'm done with the district metrics, I might want to hand it over to you and put you on the spot if you've got anything um, related to uh, city and, or at least city, city stats. Uh, so I'll switch over to the district metrics. As you can see, um, just around the Thanksgiving mark, we had a bit of a spike uh, that seems to be on its way down now. Um, 363 cases by week over the year. Uh, the more interesting information is under additional district data. So you can see again here around the, let's see, 20, what was 25th was Thanksgiving. A little bit after that, we started to see a spike when people returned to school, got up to 10% at Jefferson, sorry. Um, and then the other one that was standing out was also Roosevelt. But all up, uh, it looks like we're on the way back down again with those. So no one's really, although Jefferson is hovering around the 7 to 8% mark at the moment. And that's really uh, it. And just Laura? to clarify, Jamie, that 7 to 8% is quarantines plus actual cases. That's quarantines, yeah. That's uh, currently on an isolation or quarantine. So one or the other. If, you, if you're in isolation, you're not classed as quarantine. So it's not a double, double dip there. Um, quarantined are non-positive, isolation are positives. The top one here, I believe, yeah, this is just isolation. So these are the, the percentage rate of infections over the last seven days. And let's pick Jefferson because we know that was up there. So 2.3% was their highest that they're currently at with positive cases. Roosevelt was around two as well. 
if we scroll this, down, find this out is actually this is actually current up until yesterday. So we only report on the day prior because sometimes uh, Caitlin and her team are so busy that they're still entering current day statistics later in the evening. So, Tim, was that you that spoke? Yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I just wanted to point out, you know, mid November, you know, how interesting things can get with kids excluded from school when you look at Roosevelt. Um, Underwood STEM, I mean, we're talking about a quarter of the student population, right? If I'm reading that right. Um, yeah, and I, actually, Tim, the day prior, I think we were up around 30%. I, I had to exclude it here because it was concatenating and you couldn't see the numbers. But at, at what their peak, Roosevelt's peak was actually 30%. I used to know this number, but historically, can, does anybody know what uh, pre COVID, what uh, our typical absenteeism percentage was. I don't. Uh, so I, I I used to know it, but I don't remember. Do you remember, Ken? No pressure. I remember. Okay. I'm pretty well. It was a lot lower than this. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think. I mean, not perfect, because you remember we had a lot more influenza and other illness that we didn't have in the mask to era. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at having kids back to school at a baseline amount, um, or even better, um, would, you know, then, then that's our goal would be to reach a pre pandemic amount of absenteeism in my mind, which <clears throat> side note could be improved upon, I think with some, some of the strategies here and continuing some masking, but that that's a much broader question. But I think if you're looking for how to achieve that, that what is achieving that goal look like? it's getting close to pre-pandemic absentee numbers. The only other thing I would ask, Jamie, I should have asked this last week, is there a way to superimpose the 2020 data on top of the 2021 data? Because to get to Dr. Nolan's point, if we want to be a little forward thinking, um, one of the ways we could do that is look at um, last year's infection rates and, and, and burdens. And this these curves look remarkably similar to last year's uh, curves, maybe not in volume, but certainly in shape, off by maybe one week. Um, so part of that forward thinking is, hey, as a district, maybe we just have to plan on rough Novembers for a while. Um, and when we're gonna see those things dip. Um, so we get a sense of the cycle. And two years is certainly not something to hang your hat on, but it's better than flying in the dark like we were last year. But It'd be nice to see those curves superimposed because I think they're almost identical. Yeah, if I, can re if I can recover the data for last year, and I'm sure it's somewhere, um, I think it would probably look better in a graph, right? So we could have two lines, one for each year. slide that you showed, you know, with the actual, um, you know, Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, based on our current setup, I'm not sure if we'll be able to have that update you know, as often as daily, but at the very least, I should be able to pull something and, and at least give us a look for, you know, today in the last six months and where we were at the same point 12 months ago. And Laura uh, Stevens, I think you have to leave in four minutes. So if you have anything you would like to add about data, um, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, I don't have anything specific to share. Um, usually our data has a bit of a leg as well, so I don't have anything much more up to date than what was shared through that dashboard. Um, I would just reiterate, we are seeing a spike in cases and we haven't seen that start to go down yet. So um, just keeping an eye on that. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this evening. Um, Tim, if I recall last year, the peak that uh, we had was uh, on the 12th of November. Yeah, feels about right. And then another one, you know, around the around the holidays, and then really after the holidays, we started to see things come down when we were expecting things to go back up. Um, so again, uh, it'd be nice to see those things superimposed. I think the community could really sort of start to wrap wrap their minds around it a little bit. Now, how long we can use that? Looking forward, it's hard to say. I mean, until last year, we told everybody that RSV happened in the winter. And then for the first time ever, it happened in the summer. Um, so you have to allow for strange exceptions like that. But um, I think it's really useful to see those two things superimposed. 
Um, I do have a question for those of you in practice in the community. Are you guys starting to see the flu going around? Because I had a couple cases last week, but. A little bit. Um, we always see a little early influenza uh, A, um, but certainly not in the huge volumes that we get in a typical typical year where it becomes that, that two week blast. So um, I would say the usual amount for this time of year. Well, yes, usual amount for this time of year. I have to say one of the things that stood out to me when I looked at that data just now and is like, makes me really feel excited is the high school numbers. Did you see how low those high school numbers were? Yeah, I agree. That's amazing. I'm super, super excited to see that. I think that gives me so much hope about our goal of keeping kids, as many kids in school as we can. Yeah, and Jenny, I wouldn't be surprised, again, looking back, if those numbers are actually lower than pre-pandemic numbers. Um, you have kids vaccinated and you, ha and you have mitigation in, in place that that helps against other viruses and, you know, as well. So um, I, being as I'm handling the data, I do want to comment on that, that we're seeing at least I'm, I'm just talking from a numbers perspective. Uh, we do see infections at that level, but less quarantines. And I'm sure Caitlin can speak to the, the quarantine policy and guideline at, at, at that level of school. Yeah, I mean, yeah. vaccinations and then the three to six foot exception the CDC had this year definitely has led to less quarantines at the seventh and up grades. Um, just looking at back at the data from last year, it looks like it was, we definitely had more secondary cases than we had elementary, not by much, but we had more secondary. I know we definitely quarantined more secondary students but this year, all the cases are really sixth grade and under the majority of them. There's still cases at seventh and up. It's just there's not nearly as many quarantines. So if we want to put an analytical slant on it, if you look at the column I've got highlighted there, that's the isolation or the positive case rates in all of the schools. And it, it's lower in the high schools, but it's kind of around the mark of what a lot of the other schools are. Whereas if you look at the, um, you know, percent of students excluded by day, it's obviously a lot lower in the high schools because, you know, the exclusion uh, guidelines or policies or the t whatever term we're using are, are, are different at that level. Hopefully that helps. Jamie, can you flip to the other screen? Because there's actually a breakdown by grades. Yep. Um, the lower left hand. Mm -hmm. in a lower right hand um, breaks down uh, cumulative cases kind of over time and by week. And I find that to be a kind of a nice visual too to capture that. Sure. So we can look at, I think I can select them. Uh, let's see. Yep. What are we looking at here? Middle school, high school. That's the staff one, Jamie, the one on the left oh, is the staff one, yeah. Uh, this one is nine through 12, lower. The next one up is six or eight, PK through two, three through five. And this is just overall. Well, and I know when you, I mean, when you look at it by percentage, it looks like, oh, what's the difference? 0.2 to 0.5, but that is a double, you know, that is twice as high of rate at that level. And when you see it on these graphs, I mean, that's certainly better. The high school level is, is you know, doing t essentially twice as well as our elementary kids. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I wasn't contradicting. I was just pointing out that, you know, when it comes to exclusions, there's definitely a, 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 a marked difference in the high schools. Um, quick question. Do we know how many elementary kids have been vaccinated, like percentage-wise, yet? Or will we be able to get that information? 
We don't at this time. Um, we are asking parents to provide vaccination records when they are done with their vaccination series. Um, what we have found with the secondary students, I'm sure will hold true for the elementary, is that parents aren't actually providing it until their child is put in quarantine. We only have one school that was proactive and was able to get all vaccination records prior to the start of the school year. Um, the rest, they're just coming in as the kids go into quarantine. So I expect it will be similar for our elementary school parents. And today, if I recall, is the first day that people could be would be considered fully vaccinated if they got in that because it was two weeks or five weeks ago Wednesday. Well, well, the second shot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So then, is it just like scanning a copy of the card? Is it uploading Weir? What are you? We will take a printout from the medical or vaccinating provider, a copy of the WER or a copy of your vaccination card. Um, we can always verify against the WER if for some reason something doesn't look quite right. Uh, but we will, we had just take any formal, any formal documentation that your kid is vaccinated, we'll accept it. We don't need a hard copy. It can be a photocopy. You can snap a picture and you can email it to your school's office. Um, please don't send them to nursing team directly. I can't enter that many that fast. Send them to your school's office. We have somebody at every building who enters immunizations on a regular basis and would love to enter your child's COVID vaccination records into our system. I think maybe putting that on like the, you know, principal announcements mm -hmm. that go out via the email would be really helpful. I was thinking the same thing, Kristen. I... This is the first I've actually heard we were supposed to do that because my kids have had both their shots and I <laughs> did not turn anything in. So uh, I didn't know we were supposed to do that. Uh, I believe it's going to be coming up in the next several newsletters and it's been in the newsletters off and on since uh, the school year started, at least more so in the secondary than elementary because it wasn't applicable until now. Perfect. Thank you. So I guess moving forward, though, um, as far as being at risk for needing to quarantine, if a child in elementary school is now fully vaccinated, that may lower the amount of kids potentially quarantined? Correct. Correct. Is Caitlin, can you, I was going to ask if Caitlin can um, share again where we're at with our secondary students who've been eligible for a period of time. I know we've discussed that number again, but it might be good to keep it top of mind. You mean the how many have been vaccinated that we know of? Yeah, the percent, kind of our percentage of students. I, and, I, and I can't remember if what we've shared before is percentage of students in Wauwatosa that have been vaccinated in the 12 to 18 range or if it's been the Wauwatosa School District students. So it may have been Laura's data from the city of Wauwatosa. I'll have to look up Laura's old information. I don't have a, I don't have the data for today for the kids in Wauwatosa. I know our data is incomplete as a district because like I said, parents haven't been proactive about sending it in. Right now, it looks like only a third of our secondary students have been vaccinated, but I know it's a lot more than that. I think that was Laura's data. Yeah, Dr. Jess Wenger, that was 80% of the eligible uh, kids in TOSA, but not, but that would not correspond to the school district. Correct. Okay. I knew it was high, uh, but I didn't remember how high. Thank you. Is this an appropriate time for us to transition to recommendations for uh, revising mitigation strategies in the district? And um, I think Tim, you shared with me, I can share my screen. <clears throat> I'll share my screen so people can see the suggestions. it may be best for you to just walk us through the recommendations here. Sure. So when we we're re-looking at the reentry plan, um, what what looks good, what needed to be amended now that we have a vaccination available for the majority of our students and just uh, things that um, maybe shouldn't have been in there in the first place. We just want to make a couple of quick amendments to the reentry plan that we're going to ask the board about. But 
One of the first things we want to do, um, currently, if you have illness symptoms that are consistent with COVID, children have to stay home for 10 days or they have to receive a negative COVID test. Um, we want to add a third avenue for kids to return to school, and we want to allow their medical provider to write a letter of clearance to return to school. Um, this is already a practice we do for our kids who have chronic illnesses. Um, so we just want to make it available. The It's more of a common sense approach, letting doctors be doctors. So if a family chooses to do an at-home test and that at-home test is negative and their medical provider feels that that is a valid way to prove that they do not have COVID, then their doctor can write a letter stating that they can return to school if that's their choice. Um, it's, it's just providing more flexible options. Uh, a lot of kids have been through a lot of COVID tests. so. We do have the blessings of at-home tests, and that's one thing we wanted to add in. Do you want to talk about each one or go through all of them? Yeah, let's just go through all of them. All right. Um, the next one, quarantines for in-school exposure. Currently, we use the CDC definition of a close contact, so that is being within six feet of an individual for a cumulative of 15 minutes throughout the course of the day. Um, and then there is a three to six foot exception when everybody's universally masked. The three to six feet are close contacts, but they don't have to quarantine. Um, we want to just change how we're identifying our close contacts or who we are sending into quarantine. And we want to say that when there is one positive case in a classroom, uh, all unvaccinated students would have to go home to quarantine. Uh, there's a longer explanation further on in the document. If anybody got to reading all of that, I can speak to that, but that is another change we wanted to make. This just honors the free movement that is already happening in our classrooms and the fact that teachers are teaching and not keeping track of where kids are. They're doing their best. They're trying their hardest. It's nothing that they're failing at. It is just, it. they're doing their job at teaching and kids are being kids and they're moving around. And it's really hard to find close contacts um, that are accurate. So we just want to adjust how we're sending kids home into quarantine to honor what's happening in our building. Um, and then when we were looking at our different levels, we noticed that we still had social distancing for large gatherings being required at three feet. When we are in levels one and two, we want to change this to recommended, but not required. Again, this is for just large gatherings. And again, we listed um, social distancing on a bus is required to be three feet in levels one and two. We just want to remove that when we're in level one and two, it better reflects it what's actually happening in those levels. So those are the proposed adjustments to the reentry plan that we want to make. Any questions? The masks. Yeah, will masking still be required? So in the reentry plan, the masking is outlined. So it is optional for those who are vaccinated in level two. It is optional for all in level one. Three and up, it is universally required. Why is that? Are we taking questions from audience? Okay. Why is that? Where, where is the data that supports doing this? Dr. Means, last time that I was in here, you said that these other schools that don't require masking, that we're doing better in this district with numbers. And someone asked if you could provide that information. Where, where is that information? Are there any other questions from the committee? I'm going to go down and kind of discuss each one of these. We, I don't have any will. questions, but okay. So you're just going to ignore me asking you this over and over and over again? And all the parents like me? Last time I sat here and I listened to you guys talk about the real crisis being mental health. And pretty much, I think I can't tell, but I think it was one of the doctors here in this room saying that that's the real crisis and that they can't tell you exactly when to stop this and how to proceed. It's up to the parents. We decide what our children need, not you people. Do you understand that? You don't tell us what to do with our children. That is not what you do. Okay, it's clear to me and anybody who has looked into this at all, that you guys have no idea what you're talking about, what you're doing. You're just listening to the person above you, each one of you. You're an elected school board listening to an unelected group of doctors who I'm sure are very competent professionals who are then listening to another unelected bureaucracy 
and the CDC. The CDC does not run the Wauwatosa School District, okay? People do, we do. I'm not concerned one bit what any other parent wants to do with their child. Nowhere else in this city, the people have spoken that we won't do this. We will not wear masks forever. That's where you people are on the path to. We're two years down on this. With no end in sight, absolutely no information, no data showing that what you're doing is helping one little bit. But you just keep doing it. And there's no example in history where the people who are forcing compliance to the rest of the people who are the good guys. You think you people are the good guys? So that makes me a bad guy, though, right? The one who's here because I have to drive to the, my daughter's school every other week with ibuprofen for her headaches, and they come home with headaches all the time because they're constantly inhaling their waste gases. Okay? You guys don't do, I, I'd be shocked if any of you have read any, any research, any, any medical papers, right? Have you, has the Wauwatosa School Board published anything in, in, in the Lancet or in the British Medical Journal or the- Dr. Or Beans, do you think that we could, I, I don't know how to, I know in yeah, school Tim. we have like a, a process for this, for, for community comment. And I'm just afraid that this is gonna like, we're gonna derail if we, can we just come back to the committee talking about um, specific documents? From the, from the Zoom meeting, I can't mute that specific mic, but Tim, if you could do that, please. Jamie, maybe you could reiterate how these medical advisory meetings. I can do that. Thank I can do that. Thanks. So there's, there's... I'm not supposed to be talking right now. I understand that. Okay, but I'm finished with your rules and all this. You use a little petty, you know, authoritarian. You don't have any power. You understand? And you just sit there behind your mask and stare at me like I'm the one with the problem. Okay. All throughout history, you wonder, how do these systems take hold? It's people like you who think you're doing the right thing, but you don't have the first clue as to what is going on here. And the next thing that's going to come down is what? The shots. You, you mandate, you make all these, you bully these little kids into wearing masks. At least the high school kids, they, they're, they're of, uh, of an age and of a mind where they can do what they want to do. Okay, and, and then you have to try to make try to make a high school kid do anything. Do any people even have kids? Right, but it's the little kids that you bully into this. You don't have to. I'd love for you to acknowledge me and address me. This is a medical advisory committee meeting. The way that the committee meeting is structured, committee yes, member. Where I can be, okay, but once again, <clears throat> once again. I've done that. I've come here and I sit here quietly and I say my little three minutes and Mr. Doman as rude as he can be, right? And you shake my hand and thank me for my comments. I don't want you to thank me for my comments, okay? okay? I want you to listen to me, okay? You don't get to make these decisions for our kids. And then you, you don't provide any, any kind of justification for what you do or what you're doing. You talk about numbers and cases and all this nonsense. It's all nonsense. And you're all exasperated and you can exhale, but you can't address what I'm saying. Caitlin, I do have a question regarding other school districts. I know a lot of them don't have, um, they're not doing contact tracing, et cetera. Do you know what the percentage positive those other school districts are? Other school districts have the same illness guidelines as us, and they do still do contact tracing. They just don't require quarantines. So parents are still informed. So thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so I, I don't compare our data to other districts for a couple of reasons, just because we do require quarantines and with that quarantine comes the option to reduce quarantine. So we, as a community, have more tests um, of ACE, of people who don't have illness symptoms. So to me, the data doesn't really 
compare well because in other districts only students with illness symptoms are really seeking out testing. Um, but it it just depends on the district. You'll find some that are higher than us. You'll find some that are lower than us. But it's just again, our kids are testing more because we're they're testing to reduce their quarantine. Okay, that's helpful to know. Where are we? <laughs> So why don't we move on to, um, I don't know if we need to go over definitions, Caitlin, um, and, but for full disclosure, why don't we go to that piece? Let's not spend a lot of time there. I would like to get to our recommendations. So fully vaccinated two weeks after the second dose. Um, current letter from medical provider, and that's again, to allow for a path to return to school. That uh, has to be with, since the illness symptoms have started and cannot exceed 30 days. Uh, and then access to vaccination records, just so we're very clear, currently in our district, there are designated people who have access to those vaccination records. That access to vaccination records will not change as we start talking about masks being optional for our vaccinated individuals. So teachers would not be provided a list of vaccinated students so that they could verify who needs to have their mask on and who doesn't. Uh, vaccination records are accessed by those who are performing the contact tracing, such as nursing, administrative assistant, health aides, um, select IT support staff and administrators have access to vaccination records. And that's how it's always been in our district and that will not change. Thank you. So when we go to the rationale for changing quarantine process, I, I, we talked about this at our last last week's meeting, but uh, I think Caitlin, you live this every day along with your team. If you could just give the context again in terms of what's happening when we do try to contract trace. Yes. Yeah, so things out. Last year, we did a combination of student and staff interviews and seating charts. Um, as I just mentioned a little bit earlier in last meeting, our kids are moving more freely around the school environment. They're not necessarily adhering to the seating charts their teachers are making for them. Um, teachers are focusing on teaching. And so talking with teachers, it's really hard for them to accurately assess who is close contacts with who. So we turn to not relying as much on staff uh, interviews or on seating charts and relying more on uh, interviewing of the student themselves. And as the year has gone on, students are identifying fewer and fewer close contacts or parents are refusing to let us talk with their kids or kids are, I, we suspect are lying to us and saying they sat alone at lunchtime. It, it, the data, how we collect it was no longer, is no longer accurate. So that we have to make a change for how we are identifying people who need to quarantine. Um, this change does not uh, mean that we would not be identifying close contacts. It just means we're redefining how we're doing it as a district. It also means the health departments will still contact trace as they have this whole pandemic. And if they issue a quarantine notice, we would still honor it as we would for any communicable disease um, that is reported to being within our buildings. So where does this go? And so then we go into some of the data that we've been able to collect from September 1st to November 2nd. Um, and for time's sake, I'm gonna just move us on to the recommendations. So, um, Caitlin, do you wanna start with the recommendations that we would like to present to the board first this committee and then eventually to the board next week? So we want to, we will continue to notify the health department of all positive cases that were within our buildings, um, just like we would for any other communicable disease. We would continue to honor any quarantine notices or isolation notices the health department issues, but due to logical logistical challenges in identifying true close contacts, um, we would, when there's identified case within a classroom, all unvaccinated students would have to quarantine for CDC and DHS guidelines. What is the justification for that? Okay. And then what is the justification for quarantine? So then what else in, in terms of when you go to our recommendations to the mitigation levels? Symptoms. Sir, I'm sorry, it's really hard for me to focus and understand. It's really hard to continue on with what you people are doing too. That's why I'm here. This is not, this is not, I've been here three times, okay? This is not like the first thing. It is not the first place I want to go to. 
or have to come here and speak this way. I would much prefer to have a conversation, but that's not what you guys do. You talk about these recommendations, you're not recommendations, you are compelling children, you're forcing kids to do this. Do you realize that? Sir, you guys are just delusional. Thank you. Sir, I, I, we've, we've been my very patient. Aaron. My name is Aaron Bridges. Well, Mr. Mr. Bridges, sir, my name is Aaron. Mr. Bridges, we yes. have been very patient with you, and you've we've allowed you. With me okay, sir. You've been what? patient. <clears throat> Caitlin, why don't we move on to um, the recommendations to to the mitigation when, when rules? Do you Mr. Bridges. The parents like me. Mr. Bridges, you're, you're being extremely, you're being extremely rude at this you. time. You are extremely rude. Uh, so is the rest of the panel. Thank you, sir. I, we're so we're on a based, based on you how you're engaging right now. You guys, based the parents, we have no say in it. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage in an argument with you. How it's quarantine, right? You know, so thank you, Mr. Bridges. Thank you, Mr. Bridges. Right. So, okay, we we can't have two conversations, and Mr. Bridges doesn't want. Then to be respectful. Don't just so why don't, why don't we go to the recommendations of the change in mitigation levels and uh, phase one, Caitlin, what would that look like? So we are recommending that we move east and west to level two based on their current internal metrics. Um, currently we weigh, we've been weighing community metrics more than we've been weighing internal data. Um, at some point, we need to start looking at our internal data and weighing that more and allowing our schools to move. East and west have solidly been in a level two this whole school year, um, we would like to move them into a level two. Uh, we want to adopt the listed above amendments to the reentry plan. And the as soon as we can make those adoptions would be December 14th after the next board meeting. So you want to effectively and then phase, phase two would be moving individual phase. schools into their appropriate level based on their internal metrics. Decisions would be made by superintendent, building principal, and nursing. Uh, schools would only change levels if there's a two-week trend in internal metrics that it's indicates so a level needs to be changed. Um, the school board would be consulted if a school needed to move into level four or five as we had laid out when we first presented the reentry plan to the school board. And this would happen after the Christmas break. So just a refresher of what the different levels are and the mitigations there, Dr. Means pulled them up. So based on based on the, the, the recommendations here, it, as soon as if the board approved these recommendations, as soon as next week, Tuesday, if a high school, and we just mentioned that the high school numbers, their, their infection levels uh, internally were very low, if they were at a level one, masks would be, would be optional for all students. That's if true. they were, yeah, if they were at an option right two, right. if they were at a level two, then it would be optional for those who are vaccinated. Which again, Dr. Eric Jessup Anger pointed out that we have a high vaccination rate within the city of Wauwatosa. So that's good news, I believe, in terms of what we've been hearing from some community members. Um, not all. Not all community members. I want to be very clear that there's some community members who have some apprehension around around this recommendation. And then starting with and then starting with January 18th, based on internal metrics for individual schools. So if individual schools are low with their internal um, their internal metrics, then they would also have the ability to go to optional masking if they were, if they had children who were vaccinated and um, they could they could decide not to wear their mask. If they were at a level one, it would be optional for all students. So there, these recommendations does create, the way I'm reading them, it creates a pathway for us to, to give people an option or a pathway to eventually have options around masking. Can I go back? Um, can I ask one question? So, uh, when the initial reentry plan talked about these levels with regard to both community rates and internal rates, so are we are we still looking at community rates in any way? Are we only using in internal um, rates? Um, which kind of gets back to my 
point earlier about superimposing um, year to year data and being able to forecast a bit. Um, you know, which are, or are we going to, how are we using community rates or are we not using community rates anymore? Well, right now we've only used the community data. Oh. We just need to start using our internal data as well, okay. whether it's 50 50, whether it weighs more than the community data. But right now we haven't made any changes because we've only been using the community data. Mm -hmm. And our internal data is so great. Yeah. Despite I mean, the despite ops. the community data. Yeah. And yes, yeah. there there could potentially be more COVID spread in our buildings. Okay. Um we have a path to increase mitigation efforts then in our reentry plan, but at some point we have to try. So it allows us the freedom to kind of look at which rate we feel affects us more or less at any given time, right? It also allows us to control our own destiny mm -hmm. uh, in terms of sure. stakeholders within those schools are masking and or are vaccinating, then you will see lower infection rates. And if you have infection rates, then the ability, if the goal is for people to have options around masking or not masking, then we need everyone within that school community to do their part to get us to that place. Then once we arrive at that internal infection rate, then you have the option. You have that arrive. flexibility. We don't arrive. Then we just do this forever. I have a couple of we questions. Haven't, uh... We have it. We I think it's a little bit of a misstatement to say we've been using our community infection rates and in, in kind of ignoring the internal, because based off of the structure that the board agreed upon at the beginning of the year, we would have been in level four, but board agreed upon being on level three mainly because of our internal rates, and so um, it's not it's not changing one to the other. It's we we've been a blend. And it, it's it, it's continuing to be a blend, kind of the way you're describing it. Sorry, Jenny, I talked over you there. Oh, that's okay. I I raise. I'm going to raise. I'll raise my hand because it's. I don't have a, a dire um, question that needed to be asked at that moment, but I have two concerns slash questions about this proposal. My first is how are we how are we determining who is vaccinated? So if our if the the crux of our model being successful is that people who are vaccinated can take their masks off, but how are we verifying that without this undue burden of it falling on nursing staff or or teachers to try to verify who's vaccinated or we're just trusting that people are being honest, which you know. Yeah. To trust that people are being honest. We cannot provide vaccination status to teachers and nursing will not go around and verify that the unvaccinated students are keeping their masks up. So it will be based on our students being honest. And we recognize that some students might make other choices and we have accepted that risk. I think that's a huge risk that I think we should probably be really thoughtful about. Um, the second question or concern that I have is this date. So even if we do decide or the school board decides to adopt this, I'm, I'm quite concerned about how quickly this would change. Um, as Chastity had alluded earlier when we were goal setting, we really want to be thoughtful about mental health and these transitions are huge and scary for people. And there are a number of people who in the school want to wear their mask and feel safer because everyone else is masking. And I think we need to give people time to wrap their heads around that, as well as perhaps people who are um, not recognizing that this new quarantine data might mean that their child who is not yet vaccinated or hasn't started the process could be quarantined quite a bit. Because if you're at middle school or high school and you're transitioning from class to class, I presume you could get lots of people in quarantine very quickly. So I have concerns about the, the timing of this as well. Thank you for the feedback, that's helpful. I do want to just point out that our schools are great at accommodating a number of students' comfort levels and that when the time does come uh, for masks to be optional for those who are vaccinated, those students that don't feel comfortable in that environment, our building staff will work with them to create a plan that's specific to them and their comfort level. There, I mean, I know Sonia can probably speak more of that, but 
they'll allow students different places to eat. They'll allow students to move further away in a classroom. They'll, they'll help them find strategies that will make them more comfortable if that's what they need to continue to attend school. And I do appreciate that. I'm just thinking the school board meetings on the 13th, and we're saying this would go into effect the 14th. That gives nobody any time to prepare or plan for any of that. So I, I would like to see a buffer in there if this were to pass. Do you have a suggestion for a date? Right now. I would say, honestly, I would, I would like to push it. If it were up to me, I'd push it out five weeks because I'd give people the chance to go get their child court vaccinated if they aren't already, because at the middle school and high school level, your child is probably very high risk for getting exposed and getting quarantined very quickly. Otherwise, I would say after winter break, if people don't agree with the five weeks. What's your plan for the people who don't get vaccinated? What do you do then? <clears throat> this is a legitimate question. Any other questions from the committee? I just want to confirm, Caitlin, that the health department will quarantine, right? Um, like, tell me again, who will, who, whom will they quarantine? So the health department does contact tracing. They contact every positive person and they ask them if they can identify their close contacts. Mm -hmm. um, they do, they ask for all scenarios where schools only ask about the in-school exposures. Uh, they will continue to do that. So they would continue, let's say there's a sleepover or birthday party, they would continue to potentially uh, issue quarantines for those. So they would cover school also? They do also cover school right now. It's a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure when we stop asking as many questions, they'll start asking more questions. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they, they can issue quarantines for an in-school exposure. This is Laura. I can help answer that. I was I jumped off for a bit, but I was able to jump back on. Um, the reason we worked with the school in the past is because they're better able to identify those close contacts within the classroom. Um, so we worked with them to identify those, whereas um, typically we'll just do interviews over the phone. They're able to better identify who those close contacts might be within the school. Um, that's why we worked so closely with them um, over the past couple of years. It's just unfortunately for the reasons I stated before, it's not nearly as effective as it was last year. I'm trying to frame this question the right way. Um, when everybody has had the option to, um, to, and has had the opportunity when they've chosen to um, get vaccinated and our level is, you know, low enough, will there be, and Laura, I guess this is equally a, a question for you, Will there come a point where we won't bother quarantining even unvaccinated people who are exposed who are asymptomatic? I don't have a specific answer to that. Ultimately, yes. I mean, at some point, COVID-19 will be listed as endemic. It might change from a category one disease to something different where we wouldn't have to do the same follow-up that we do. Right now, we don't do close contacts for flu. Um, it, it might be similar to that in the future where, you know, we would recommend, you know, kids stay home if they're sick, but we, we wouldn't need to quarantine close contacts. Okay. So, yeah. So that's really going to be defined by, that, that can't be defined by us, I guess, is my point. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Caitlin, it's, it's Nolan. Do you, do you have a concept of how this change in quarantine will affect the quarantine numbers? especially like on somebody mentioned the high school and middle school level where you're kind of bouncing from class to class. And I would imagine one positive case who's there all day long, considered symptomatic, can put eight classrooms or seven classrooms into quarantine. Do we think it's going to increase our quarantine numbers versus what they have been? I haven't had time to really play around with the numbers predicted, but I mean, currently we have full classrooms. So we've already seen double the number of close contacts that we, we did last year at this time, because last year we were hybrids. So we only had half the students in there. Um, it, it will, once people actually provide their vaccination records, I don't know that it's going to make that much of a difference um, to tell you the truth. So many of the kids in the secondary buildings are already vaccinated and that's why they do have such low quarantines. I think it will increase it by a little bit, but I think more and more kids continue to get vaccinated. It will continue to go down. 
uh, Sean, I was kind of wondering about the same the same thing. I mean, I was just trying to think of in an ideal world, how would I go about, again, in the interest of maximizing school attendance, how would I do that? Um, I'd maximize vaccination um, for people who aren't vaccinated because another way out is having the, ex the person who's uh, infectious and everybody around them being masked. So I was thinking, well, <laughs> you could have seating charts where the unvaccinated person is literally surrounded by vaccinated people. I mean, that would mean, but I'm assuming there's no way, right, that we can do Again. anything more to protect Unvaccinated I just want to be really clear. We are not providing vaccination status I, to classroom teachers. So, I know. So those of us at home, I know. that's not going to happen. I just, I understand I, where you're going. I just have to be I'm very just, clear. I want to make it really clear. There's nothing more that we can really do to protect unvaccinated people other than have a mask, right? And get vaccinated or Correct. choose a different path. We could right. allow unvaccinated students to self-identify and move further away if they wanted to try and avoid a quarantine, for sure. Yeah. Um, and like that goes back to what I was saying with schools adjusting and or making adjustments for individual students at their request. So if an unvaccinated student uh, wanted to ensure that they wouldn't have to quarantine, I'm sure we could move them six feet away from their peers in the classroom or give them a space in the corner. And th yeah, and then I think that would just, again, be something that we need to communicate effectively to the community. Hey, this is an option for you to voice that need if you need, right? And, uh, and, it, and then it becomes a staffing. Do we have the people to, to meet those individual requests and needs? A uh, certain threshold, I'm sure, because we only have so much distance. Right, again, right. right. That schools are going to work with individual students for their comfort level. It sounds like you guys are like you're you're forced to do something along these lines for sure, just with the inability to really contact trace and everything. And it seems like a valid way to go about it. I think like you guys were talking about having that out for you know students who uh, choose not to be vaccinated or families who choose not to vaccinate their children, um, is so that they can still be in school while we are in this uh, mode of quarantining and everything is important as well though. Any other comments from the committee? I wanted to loop back to that first thing with the medical provider note. Yes. Yes. Sean, in in your, your example, you said twice an at-home test and a medical provider note but it doesn't say anything about an at-home test. It just says a note from a medical provider and it doesn't define medical provider at all either. And so I just say, I know a lot of different medical providers and I'm wondering what exactly we mean and what the rationale is for that, adding that on. And, and I know a lot of physicians are parents of children and doesn't need to be somebody else. Cause I do know some people who would write a letter on behalf of their own child. Parents are not allowed to submit letters on behalf of their own child. It has to be the child's medical provider. Um, in my time here, I think I've gotten one letter that way, and we were able to uh, uh, we were able to fix that. Um, so, when I say medical provider, I mean a someone who takes care of your physical body and can assess your illness and wellness status. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily be a therapist. It wouldn't be mental health. It would have to be. I don't want to say doctor because it could be a nurse practitioner, it could be a PA, whoever is working in your child's primary clinic. It could be an urgent care provider. I think you're going to have to define credentials. I'm happy to do that. That's fair. In, you mentioned the at-home test. Is this just for at-home tests as well? Or is this for just, I just need a note from a medical provider that says, even with my fever, I can go back to school without a test? Well, it's only when symptoms are consistent with COVID. If you have a medical provider that has evaluated you and has decided that you are cleared to return to school because of their evaluation, then you would be able to clear come back to school. Sean, can I? Can That's I just, a really good medical provider. I don't know a lot of medical providers that are that smart, to be honest. But. Well, and that's fine. The medical provider can say, well, we're going to do a COVID test anyways, or they can say, you have a history of chronic illness here. These are all your chronic illness symptoms. You're, you can go back to school without a COVID test. It allows the conversation to happen with the child's doctor um, and the parent and the child instead of with arguing 
about, oh, you have to have a test or not, but my child has these chronic symptoms. It allows really that's it's a path to let doctors have the conversations with the parents. Sean, um, in the primary, I'm sorry, Christina. Okay. Um, you know, every disease process is, you know, like when they walk in our office, you start to get a sense of like what it does and what, what it doesn't do. And the, it was really hard with COVID at the beginning to know, okay, what is this actually going to look like in young kids, medium age kids and teens, like all other illnesses that present very differently in those different age groups. And you're just sort of waiting to gain that, you know, experience. Um, and again, this is end of one speaking, but um, I think the most remarkable thing about COVID and little kids is it's it's just super plain. You know, it just doesn't do um, certain things that other viruses do. Like, I don't see a single kid with uh, croup, for instance, where you test them and it's COVID. Uh, not a single kid with a rip-roaring ear infection and they test positive for COVID. Or um, um, there are other examples, I guess. Um, so... I mean, when I have a when I have a child in the office with croup, I almost don't even bother testing, to be honest with you, because they're never positive for COVID, they're positive for influ for paraflu or something else. So I think as time goes on, there will be some, at least for myself, and you know, maybe again, maybe my situation is unique, uh, and there are maybe nine other pediatricians that would say, oh no, 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 we see COVID cause croup all the time, but my sense is that there are some ways of ruling out fairly comfortably um, with now a year and a half of experience of dealing with this um, COVID without necessarily having to test, though we will always encourage the test. But if I have five, five kids, four <coughs> of whom have tested positive for rhinovirus and the fifth comes in to get cleared to go to school, I'm not so sure I'm testing that kid for COVID. It just doesn't seem to line up with the goals that we talked about initially of just keeping the most kids in school, keeping the most kids healthy and everything. But if everybody else is cool with it, no worries. No, I, I personally think you need to make that letter pretty clear. I've had people ask me for a letter regarding their chronic illness. And I'll say this child has a history of asthma or seasonal allergies or whatever. But in that letter, I don't say that they're medically cleared or this is not COVID unless I actually test them and actually have seen them in the office. So I, you, I think need to make it really clear um, because a lot of families will look for that letter without their child actually being evaluated at that time. I totally I'm also agree. concerned about, there are some providers in the community who don't believe that COVID is a problem or that any of these types of mitigation efforts should be followed. And I'm concerned that those will be immediately sought out and we'll just mass generate letters that will go to all of the people who don't want to follow these rules. So they don't get an opinion, the people who don't agree with you, we don't get an opinion. So I appreciate the feedback. It sounds like the the goal, the goal that we, we established in terms of keeping students as safe as possible may be in jeopardy is what we're hearing. Unbelievable. I have a question. Can you clarify? Um, and maybe other children's pediatricians can clarify too. I, I'm under the assumption that children's providers are discouraged from saying they're cleared from COVID or, the, or they just report that the, the test was negative. Is that correct? I can say this child was seen in my office today, and if they had a test, I list the test below, and they can return to school on such date. Okay. If or if feeling better, but it, some of it depends on the school protocol because some schools are are different as well. Um, if they are not tested, it's difficult for us to say yes, they're medically cleared to return to school. Okay, because I think that's going to be a barrier that a lot of families will run into if they're seeking a letter. And it obviously might change a little bit based on the vaccination status, um, because this is a new, you know, for the younger age group. Chastity, can you, re can you restate that question? I'm not sure I totally followed you, I'm sorry. 
Oh, well, it's so it was my understanding that children specific pediatricians are discouraged from saying your child is medically cleared. Like they say the COVID test on X date was was negative. Um, and that's I, I think just because, you know, it, it could be a false negative and, and there's just a liability there. So I, I think that could be a barrier for some families who are seeking a letter from a medical provider. And I agree that credentials, I, I mean, if this is going to be a thing, it's going to have to be really specific um, with, with who gets to provide the letter, um, like exactly what information you're looking for, because I, I think there's just too much wiggle room. I would just say that historically, I never ever write a note that says you're no longer contagious. I mean, some of the viruses that these kids have, they'll shed for a month. I stay whether or not they're okay to go back to school, in my opinion. And um, pre-COVID, I sent kids back to school who were probably shedding, you know, Coxsackie virus for three more weeks, but they were well past their time of peak in infectivity. And, um, and so, I kind of agree, Chastity. I would never say that you're like COVID cleared to go back. I would say this child, in my opinion, meets, uh, is able to return to school, period. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes from a lot of different sources, uh, as it always, as it should. Tests are just part of it. You know, they learn in med school 90% or more of what you, uh, diagnosis comes from just history. Um, the rest is from um, physical exam and, and last tests, you know, and so, um, I agree. It's this is good. This could be really. We could spend a lot of time talking about this one piece. Um, I don't know how much time we want to spend <laughs> on this one piece. Right. I. Our goal, which is separate from the goals that we discussed earlier this evening, our goal with these recommendations to modify um, the mitigation strategies was to try to find a middle ground to try to signal to the community that we understand that you, we can't stay in the same space that we were in when we started the school year. A lot of, a lot of circumstances have changed. Um, it may not meet the needs of everyone in the community, but it does move us closer to giving people options and giving people some, some sense of this could there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So yes, what our, what we would like the committee to do is to continue to give us feedback. You're giving us good feedback on how we can strengthen this recommendation so we can go to the board. Um, some of the things that I've heard so far is potentially that phase one should not be December 14th, maybe at a minimum, the soonest it, it could be is January 3rd of 2022. Um, I'm hearing us make sure that we lay out the credentials of the people who can actually provide the letter um, that we've, we've discussed. Those are two very clear um, recommendations that I've heard from the, the committee. Are there other suggestions that you have around these, these um, I don't want to use the term relaxed, but revised mitigation strategies? Well, naturally, heard anybody say anything about that. Would illness symptoms and uh, exclusion from school also apply to um, vaccinated people who are symptomatic what with an illness? So illness disease? symptoms do apply to all individuals vaccinated or unvaccinated. Or not, right. That provides much better protection. I had a question about that as well. Um, for Since we're changing sort of the process for identifying close contacts, the CDC still recommends that vaccinated individuals get tested five to seven days after being a close contact. So I would hesitate to use that option for symptomatic vaccinated individuals that had a positive case in their classroom. Does that make sense? Give it to me one more time, Laura. <laughs> yeah, I would hesitate to use this option for vaccinated students who are symptomatic after there has been a, a case identified in the classroom. I see. Do you have anything in your recommendation plan about that? Well, I guess maybe I missed it. If you were symptomatic, wouldn't you be recommended to be tested? Yes. Vaccinated or not. So, so we're saying the same thing. Is that okay? So if you're 
asymptomatic, but you had a positive exposure, but you're vaccinated, do you, and you're not wearing a mask, you should be tested five to seven days. Is that what you're saying? Are you saying symptomatic or asymptomatic? Both. The recommendation from the CDC, okay, yeah. regardless of um, symptoms, if you're vaccinated, you should be tested five to seven days after exposure. Since we're not identifying close contacts specifically within the classroom, that recommendation should be broad for the whole class with the positive case. We recommend it, but, so but you can't require it. it. But not school policy? Right. So what Laura is saying is that if somebody was exposed, so they have a known COVID exposure, but they're vaccinated, this allowing a letter of clearance from a medical provider could potentially get them back in, it could get them back in school without having to have a test, even though they had a known exposure. Right. But I think that'll be few. I think our parents and our students want to do the right thing. I think they still want to test. Um, I mean, if this is going to make or break it, it. And you guys need to say what the right thing is to do. Do you think there's a, so getting back to keeping the most kids in school, with the relaxed, uh, or I guess not relaxed, the uh, change in the the quarantine for all people in the unvaccinated kids, and then we would also be then testing at five to six weeks of vaccinated. I think that the one risk we, they may have is that the that that the asymptomatic carriers may outweigh what we currently are seeing, just knowing that some of the data from our pre-procedural um, testing is about four point, today it was reported at 4.7% are asymptomatic here. So I, I worry that as we have more and more people who are tested because of their exposed, because we're not doing contact tracing or because we're globally doing the whole room, there's a risk that we may actually exclude more people. I'm not sure I was very clear with that. You were. we're not required like the school doesn't require tests for asymptomatic folks to come back into the classroom regardless of the exposure status right she that's what we're saying we do require that that seven, five to seven days isn't it's that what i heard she said recommended not required it's recommended but i i, I don't or, or i don't know of anybody who's doing that okay so as long as we're not requiring it so if it's just recommended not required is that what we're saying yes okay yeah, because I agree with That's you, just, Pete, that we would start picking up. I mean, the more we test, the more positives we're going to get, and that's going to be anti-goal. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's just for, that's for vaccinated, right? That's our policy for, for mm -hmm. vaccinated. You don't need to test at five to seven days. You should per CDC guidelines, but you don't need to. It's recommended. But unvaccinated, you do. No, for unvaccinated. So for unvaccinated individuals who have had a known COVID exposure, they are in quarantine for 10 days if they choose not to test, right. or they for seven days if they do test. So they don't have to test, it just changes when they can return. Right, yeah. Is it safe to say from a summary standpoint, and Dr. Nolan, I think you said it best, are the recommendations here may, may, it's a strong word I'm gonna use here, but they may be in conflict somewhat with the goals that we initially discussed this evening of, of keeping our students as safe as possible because there will be an argument from some, there's a theory that this, the safest way to keep students is to mask them all the time, no, no exceptions. This is moving us closer to the middle where there's more options. So acknowledge, acknowledging you know that we're we're moving we're moving away from that. The there story? will be some people who will say that we're we're putting that at risk. The there's also. I'm sorry, sir. I'm, You're not sorry. <laughs> Show me the data. It, doesn't it is really, it is really, it is really difficult to talk when you're talking over yes, me. Yes, I understand that. And you, and you don't mind, and you don't mind. 
You don't care that it's. Different. I'm very disappointed that you don't mind. I'm going to try to continue. I'm going to try to continue. Thank you, sir. None of these do anything. So the other. It's ridiculous. It's it's really it's ridiculous. Difficult. Where is the study? You're talking about <clears throat> science and all this. Where is the science? Show it. Where is it? Where are the studies that show that masks do what you say they're doing and keeping everyone safe? Where are the bodies piling up around all this place stuff where everybody going to Whole Foods with no mask on? Or so Dr. Means and Caitlin, I don't I don't mean to get stuck on that uh, like the the letter thing. If, if, if you might see it more, Caitlin, on your end, if it's very meaningful, then I think just having some credentials and some framework around it might be helpful uh, for sure. Um, but there was one other question that I wanted to bring up that we hadn't talked about yet, and that was the recommendation uh, with the social distancing with with level one and level two. And I really I, I like we I talked about back in the beginning with these levels like i think we need a goal like a forward goal of normalcy and level one has to be that i think and the the idea of covid zero is a fallacy now like covid is going to live with us forever and so there will always be a basal case rate of covid19 and i think that I, I, my personal opinion is that level one shouldn't even have the recommendation of social distancing in that in my mind, at least, helps kind of forward think and helps give hope to when we get to that that really low level of endemic COVID that we will get to at some point in time. Um, that we will that uh, we won't have those those recommendations for social distancing necessarily. Uh, otherwise, I agree with that one. We just hadn't touched base on that one yet. Thank you. I agree, Sean. Could we show the? Um or internal and external metrics and like what those are for each level. Cause I, I know we had started the school year at level three, even though we weren't really at level three. Is that how we did that? You did. Nonsense. You just pat yourselves in the back. Oh, everybody's doing such a great job keeping everyone safe. It's always for the public good the public welfare leave that to the parents that's our job as parents so right now our is it true is our high our high schools are kind of at the level two internal metrics is that right but or is our high schools have been level two the entire year for internal metrics like they've never bounced above the one percent i think the staff bounced above one percent at one point in time in both of our high schools but the students have always been in that level two for internal metrics We've been at level four, I think, the entire year for community metrics. But at the beginning of the year, and Dr. Means, you would know better, uh, there was discussions with the board. Part of, part of the reentry plan was the board having the option to keep it at level three if our internal metrics were okay, even if the community metrics were outside. That's accurate, of That's accurate. yes, sir. And so our high schools have been at that level two internal metric the entire year. And whether, I know we talked about that and we looked at it a lot in the beginning, we never talked about why we think that possibly is, whether or not like a lot of our high school kids have actually burned through COVID and have natural immunity or it's our, our vaccine rates, uh, which we're a little unsure of, um, or if it's a combination of those, or if they're just awesome at not being close to each other, which I doubt is true, or if they're great at wearing masks, which I doubt is true too. Um, it's probably the first and the second with natural immunity and vaccine that has gotten our uh, high school students there. And masks probably play a little bit of a role in it, but masks probably don't play a very big role in it. And there is no study out there. Like nobody can put a number on it as far as how much masks help. They probably, they do help but it, how much they help in a situation with high vaccine rates and low, um, lower infection rates. As, as both of those, as the vaccine rate gets higher and the, uh, and the infection rate gets lower, the plus that we get from masks gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Oh. I think Dr. Nolan, as part of the, the logic behind the recommendations of the mitigation shift that we proposed this evening, because ultimately, 
because ultimately we know that if we continue to stay vigilant with vaccination uh, numbers, and, and I think as Dr. Eric Jessup Anger pointed out an hour ago, the numbers are high in the city of Wallatosa. And if people continue to wear their mask as that vaccination number continues, it's almost like a sliding scale as that continues, we should get to a point where all of our schools internal metrics are at a level one or two, which then will eventually allow people to have options um, and they can control their own uh, destiny. <clears throat> There's no way you can a little more weight in the mitigation and mask use within the schools. You know, our, our vaccination, vaccination rates in the community sort of match what we're seeing in the schools. And there's still a difference in our community metrics versus our internal metrics. You know, there's a lot of pieces that could play into that, but masks are one of the big differences that help us keep those internal metrics low. Okay. In a, in a higher burden period of time, that's absolutely true. But if there's no burden in the city, then masks don't really help you at all because there's none floating around. Yeah, so we're high right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's my biggest concern with this proposed change regarding masking is that the community rates are so incredibly high right now. And, and we are not doing anything to actually verify who is vaccinated. And I understand that that's a, there's a whole lot of reasons that we wouldn't be verifying that, but that makes me very concerned about America. the risk that we're taking here. See, Jenny, I think though, if we superimpose last year's curves on this one, that we'll see that this year is proceeding just like last, such that um, as we venture, through, as we get through the holidays, there'll be a little, probably hiccup two weeks, one to two weeks out, but it'll continue a downward, a downward trend. And you, when you superimpose on top of that, um, the, all the vaccines, the curves will look probably the same, but the actual rates and numbers of people affected will be like probably dr dramatically lower. Um, so no, I think I, that is seen on that, that graph you showed, because it went back to November of 2000. 20 and if i'm recalling it's about half as high the, the 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 it looks the same but just not as high meaning exactly. that the waveform right. is the same but not as uh exactly. yeah and i'm hopeful that that trend will continue and we'll start to see a decrease after this hopeful hopefully a short spike in cases but i'm hesitant to make those decisions without seeing that come true you know i, I don't want to make a decision to remove mitigation before we actually start to see a decrease in cases. And I think pushing out the date helps with that um, for so many reasons. I don't think pushing it out five weeks for people to get vaccinated is the right way for us to attack it though. No, but I think- the especially, if, especially if we're, like if we were talking about doing this in the elementary schools, then I could see that being a good argument to have, but we're just talking about the two high schools right now is my understanding with going to the level two uh, in an earlier phase and all of the high school students have been eligible with the exception of people with allergic reactions have been eligible for the vaccine for a very significant amount of time. Um, and at some point in time, we have to make these decisions with unvaccinated people because not everybody's going to get vaccinated. And I know Sonia talked about you know, availability and equity of the vaccine. And I, I, would, I would argue that it's probably there for our high school students and has been for a long enough period of time that uh, we could probably consider them pretty close to fully vaccinated as far as how, how much vaccine that we're gonna get into those kiddos. I just, I agree with Jenny though, that if you make that start date, what was it the 14th or the 15th? I just feel like those, I don't know, that might bring a lot of anxiety on for not only students, possibly teachers, um, but just giving that leeway, I think maybe at the start of the, you know, January would be okay. But um, I also, I'm thinking going into Christmas break, not everybody just has high schoolers in their homes. You know, they have kids of varying ages. And so that gives the younger kids the opportunity to be vaccinated as well a little bit 
before the holidays. I just, I look back at all the decisions that we've made and we've always been, I think, behind a little bit. Like we probably should have gone back to school earlier last year, the five days and everything. Like there are, there are some things, even, even with, even with the community on, uh, in high burdens, like school is, and we talk about school and importance of school and everything. And I don't know if we've always followed that. And so I, I am a little bit leaning towards being a little bit more aggressive this time around, um, even with our, with our moving forward, uh, because it feels, it, it feels like it's the right thing to do probably for our community. Do you feel that this and I, I don't mean I don't mean do it like tomorrow or anything like that. I think I think that buffer period. I think if you have the meeting on the 13th and masks come off or go optional in our high schools on the 14th, that sets a lot of people up for a lot of anxiety. But waiting five weeks or eight weeks uh, for in, it's an arbitrary amount of time. Uh, so if we think it's the right time to go, giving it a week or two for people to mentally prepare and uh, would be probably more appropriate, at least in my opinion, as an honest. <laughs> associating the change with another change that we are used to, like a new year coming back after the break, um, you know, piggybacking on change on top of change, Lloyd, if the mental health feels otherwise, they're used to change. Right. It's a period where you do have to adapt, you adapt every year um, to that and feel similarly about winter break after exams, it's associated with change. but. Um, I'd be really comfortable with coming back from winter break. So if we want to pick a date, if we're talking about picking a date, um, I'd be right. If January 3rd is that first day back, um, I'd support that for high school. So I'm here saying that for phase one, it would be January 3rd. For phase two, with all the rest of the schools, it would be the day after the King holiday, which is January 18th. Gives them just a little extra time for those youngsters to finish up their vaccination. I do have a question about availability for the younger kids. Um, what what are you finding? Are you finding any problems with the younger kids getting vaccinated or availability with that? Because I do know several of the children's um, vaccine clinics have been very full, and so there are options to go to other clinics. Um, I, my kids ended up going through the Milwaukee Health Department. We waited in line for an hour each time at the drive up. And so I'm just wondering what is the availability that you've been finding? I'm sure Laura can speak to this um, better as far as, you know, TOSA specifically, but I would say that my patient population, um, that it's been um, actually pretty easy. Some have chosen to wait in line. I think the challenge right now is that you have the wave of second doses um, pouring through right now. So if you do, you know, a thousand doses three weeks ago, you're going to have a thousand people rolling in right now too um, for that second dose. So I think that's a little bit, if you're seeking your first dose right now, it's going to be a little challenging just because everybody's rolling in for their second. Um, but depending on your, you know, your family's flexibility, um, you know, in some places you can literally walk in. Um, so I'm not hearing it again in my environment, really any, any, any barriers though this, the la this, week might be unique because so many people are rolling in for their second. Right. Laura, are you able to speak to that? Yeah, I would agree with that for the most part. We do get a lot of calls uh, from parents looking for places to get vaccinated, but we're able to provide a number of locations. Some of it can be limited by their schedules as some of them are just during the daytime or during the school day or the work day, um, which makes it a little bit more challenging, but I think there are a lot of options out there right now. And the district's going to be hosting a vaccine clinic uh, 16th and 17th, which, by the way, we'd like some medical volunteers if anyone's available that day. Um, we need a couple more friends who happen to be here. I promise I would ask you guys tonight. Um, I've only ever heard, I've, I've only heard one parent who expressed that they were having trouble getting their child in. It, again, it was more due to hours of openness and them being a working parent than anything else. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask and call the final question in regards to any other.
challenges that the committee may have with these amendments or recommendations to change of levels. One thing, Dr. Means, that wasn't explicitly stated so far, and I think anytime, anytime we move forward and I don't know, forward's the wrong word to use, I guess, but if we peel off mitigation, um, we need to be prepared to go back. And I think we need to be prepared to go back uh, in the framework that we have as well. Um, unless you guys weren't thinking that we would go back at all. But like, if we go to level two, it, if we base our mitigation off of level two for our high schools, if we go back and it was the wrong decision and we all of a sudden have lots of cases in our high schools and we find ourselves with internal metrics in level three or level four, I think we need to explicitly state that our recommendation would be going back to those mitigation strategies as well. At least when I, when I talk about moving forward and, getting, uh, taking, taking some of this mitigation away, possibly based off of the numbers that we've seen. In my mind, I'm saying that knowing that I would agree with going, putting the mitigation back on if we find ourselves with lots more cases. Like the second week of November 22. Right. <laughs> exactly. And don't be a buzzkill. <laughs> Sorry. I, so I, I agree with that, Dr. Nolan. And I think Dr. Means talked about on that in the front end, uh, if I recall, or he and I have talked about that in the past, but I think being explicit about that, um, that the internal metrics, if we, if we need to, um, it makes really good sense to me to have that built into the plan. I'd also say one thing I think, Dr. Nolan, you shared, is a feeling I've had is that we have been cautious along the way and sometimes felt a little slow to move on things. I think it's also, um, it, I was okay with that last year uh, to a degree. Uh, I know I, I wanted to kind of push and nudge to get secondary students back faster uh, than we did, but I, I understand that the community wasn't necessarily there. Um, and so I, I'm comfortable with, I think everything that you've all discussed this night and continue to really appreciate your thoughtful deliberation and um informing this process so thank you all very much i really appreciate your your thoughts and direction tonight that leads us to our last agenda item well before we move on is this an indication that the committee is comfortable with moving in a revised mitigation strategy with the amendments that have been offered. Thank you, that's uh, very helpful. The last conversation that we, we said we would com complete this evening was to discuss a time um, to, to implement the committee's work moving forward. Um, and so we discussed the fact that there would be some type of some pace and cadence that we would we would check in and have an opportunity to truly check our, our data and to ensure to Dr. Nolan's point of ensuring that the, these revised mitigation strategies are not increasing internal infection rates. Um, it seems to be that Tuesday evenings are preferred. Um, <clears throat> may I suggest that we look at starting our, our pace and cadence and meeting starting in February. Um, so it will be a month after we've allowed some flexibility with masking um, at, at the high schools and, and some of our other schools based on their in, internal metrics. Is there a certain week that works better? Is the first week better than the second week for committee members? Um, I don't have specific weeks. Tuesdays tend to be the worst night for me because that's when we have council meetings, but I'm always happy to talk offline if I can't make it. We don't, well, you're fairly important to this process. So <laughs> uh, that, that changes everything, Laura. So is there a certain day of the week that works better for you? Any day but Tuesday. Previously okay. it was on Wednesdays. Oh. That was my recollection too, Wednesday evenings. Wednesday evenings? 
Wednesday sounds great. Is there a certain day, is there a certain week? Is it the first week, the second week that works better for the committee? Well, if we do it the first week, that's four weeks of the high schools being in a different level. So there's data to review at that time. I like even numbers better than odd numbers. February 2nd. February 2nd it is. That'll be our, our next committee meeting. Okay. 6 p.m. or 7 p.m.? What's the preference of the committee? Dr. Means, I think you get to choose that. That's why you get the, the front, front of the room. I, uh, I would prefer 6 o'clock. So our next meeting is 2 2 of the year 22 at 6 p.m. Thank you, everybody.